I've entitled today's sermon, Gospel Ministry in a Pagan Culture. Our text is Acts 18, verses 1 through 17. Well, by this time in our study of Acts, Paul has been through really a long list of terrible challenges. And the trials in Corinth will only add to that list of afflictions. As, as we will see, however, the Lord rejuvenates his servant in some wonderful ways. He gives Paul companions, he blesses his work, and he fulfills his promises to his faithful servant. Therefore, tired saints can find a lot of hope in this passage. So this is God's holy, inerrant, infallible word. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own head. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians heard Paul, believed, and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God to contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, See to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And we remember uh, not only that you inspired it, but you preserved it. And that, Lord, even this morning, we remember that there are those who have given their very lives that they might translate it and provide a copy of your word to us. So we pray this morning that by your spirit, you would cause us to love your word more even than our necessary food. And Father, will you open it up to our understanding today and and transform us for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when we left Paul last week, he was in Athens. Timothy and Silas did join him. Luke doesn't mention that in the Acts account, but Paul tells us in a letter to the church at Thessalonica that he's going to write from the city of Corinth that both Timothy and Silas came from Berea to Athens. But he immediately sent them back. He sent Timothy back likely to to Thessalonica and probably Silas back to Philippi, although the text doesn't say that specifically. But you remember Paul had been provoked in Athens Uh, Pastor Chad did a a wonderful job uh, last week taking us through that passage, and he he was communicating the force of that word there, provoked. It's somebody who is is deeply distressed. Um, He's infuriated, incited. He's stirred up to anger and grief and indignation. And why was that? Because he saw that the people in Athens worshipped a multiplicity of false gods, but they didn't know the one true God. So Paul began in the Agora, that's the marketplace, and later at the Areopagus to debate and engage the Athenians concerning the one true God. What it means to know this God and what it means to know God in Christ. And so he preaches Christ and the the resurrection and the day of judgment, and he uh, preaches uh, repentance and faith, 
Now, there are those who suggest that the Apostle Paul was experimenting with the new style of preaching in Athens. You know, a preaching that engages the culture and quotes the prophets and the poets and philosophers and or not the prophets, but the poets and the philosophers and so on. You know, he's preaching that, uh, that is full of philosophy, basically. Preaching that's one step removed from the type of preaching that he'd been doing in Berea and in Thessalonica and Philippi and other places. And they think that because when it comes to Corinth, and he writes the letter to the Corinthians later, remember he tells us in 1 Corinthians, in the opening verses of chapter 2, he says when he came to Corinth that he was determined that he would not preach to them with lofty speech or wisdom. That he was determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So when they read that, some have concluded that, that Paul had been experimenting with a different kind of preaching in Athens. But now that he's in Corinth, he's going to preach Jesus. He's going to preach him crucified. He's going to abandon that style that he was trying out in Athens. Well, of course, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. And by the way, some background can clear that thought up for anyone who's, who's having it. You need to know that people of the first century loved eloquent rhetoric and dramatic delivery on stage. It was their primary form of entertainment. Audiences consisted of sophisticated listeners who knew what they liked and what they disliked. And these orators that would come and present to them, they were very gifted at reading their audience and knowing what their audience wanted. And then they crafted their rhetoric in order to please the audience. So it was kind of like a, an event, a playful exchange, if you will, between orator and audience in the hopes that the orator could win them over and kind of at the end of his speech, he would have them in the palm of his hand. And given their impressive skills of persuasion, <clears throat> these orators could convince their audience of either side of the issue. In fact, the greater the orator, the greater was his ability to take the weaker case and still win over his audience. Well, Paul, when he comes to Corinth, he says, I I'm not coming here that way. I I'm having none of that. So there's the background. Paul's not experimenting with a new style of preaching. Uh, and, and now he's just somehow recommitted himself to going back to Jesus and him crucified when he comes to Corinth. No, in Athens, Paul was boldly proclaiming Christ, the life, death, and resurrection, as he quotes Aratos and these others, as he engages and he dialogues and debates in Athens. He says to them in chapter 17, verse 30, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. You know, you can't preach resurrection unless if somebody's dead. He has to go to the cross and he preached the day of judgment where he calls everyone to repent. Sounds pretty much to me like that that's the gospel that Paul was preaching everywhere. There, but there's no doubt when he comes to Corinth, he has a renewed zeal, uh, a renewed conviction about the gospel. And we read in the opening verse of chapter 18, after this, and sometime later he heads to Corinth. In Athens, he's been in this capital of learning, a cultural center, at least of the former world. Maybe by the first century, it wasn't quite as it had been in the second and third or fourth century B.C. But Athens was still a place of great culture. So if you, if you wanted to go to culture, you go to Athens. But by comparison, Corinth was, was considered base. You know, Corinth was a city of licentiousness. There, there was a Greek verb, literally, that would translate to Corinthianize. It was a euphemism for fornication. And to Corinthianize was a well-known term for at least 400 years. So Corinth had this reputation as a very sexually immora immoral place. And 2,000 feet above the city of Corinth, uh, on a place known as the Acropolis, there, there was a, a temple to Aphrodite, the false goddess of love, beauty, and passion, and procreation. So they had a strong influence of sexual immorality in Corinth. Corinth was also a large city in Paul's day. Some say it numbered nearly 750,000 people. Some say less, but there's a large number of people there in that part of the world. And the Isthmian Games took place near Corinth about every two years. 
These games were second only to the Olympic Games. And these games, at, at these games, they would <clears throat> run races, throw the javelin, discus, all these events, boxing, wrestling, and they would do all these events in the nude. Now, the Romans frowned on that, but the Greeks did that kind of thing. And it was a big deal for these games to be held nearby. Isn't it interesting that when Paul writes his first epistle to the Corinthians, you remember in the ninth chapter, he uses these images, these metaphors from the games. He says things like, don't you know that in a race, all compete, but only one wins the race? He says, I, I box as beating the air. He says, I discipline my body. So he's alluding to these games that the Corinthians knew all too well. Now, Paul may have made his journey by sea, landing at the port of Cenchrea to east, to east of Corinth. He may have come down through the Isthmus. That's that natural land bridge there in that part of the world, some 50 or 60 miles or so to the city of Corinth. There was also another port on the western side of Corinth, ports that would lead to the Mediterranean Sea and the coast of northern Africa and beyond. This area was a marvelously geographically strategic place. It was, it was a city that was second only to Ephesus, but it was also a strategic city uh, from a gospel point of view. And interestingly, Paul stays a long time in Corinth. It was, a ne it was necessary to have in Corinth a strong church, perhaps it was, it was as necessary as in Ephesus to have a, a strong church because of where it was located. Because from Corinth, Christians could go to all parts of the world. They could, they could sell off to northern Africa, and many probably did. And, and some could go north and be God's ambassadors and, and missionaries. So with that introduction and background in mind, I want us to consider just three points from our text this morning. That is, Paul's decision to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. Secondly, Paul, God's encouragement to Paul. And thirdly... God's promise of comfort to all his people in times of trial. So first of all then, Paul's decision to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. We read in verse 6 this enormously important thing that Paul does in the synagogue and with the Jews. We read that, And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Now, according to F.F. F. Bruce, when Paul traveled to Corinth, he was in this mood of, of great dejection. And Bruce is picking up on what Paul himself said when he writes to the Corinthians, that when he came to Corinth, he said he was there in fear and in much trembling and weakness. So was it Athens that had him depressed? Was it um, the reputation of Corinth that perhaps concerned him, this city where sex and sport rather than poetry and philosophy were the gods of the day? So, so what does he do when he arrives? He goes straight to the synagogue, and he begins to reason with the Jews and the Greeks. Also, as in Thessalonica, he's doing bivocational ministry. He engages in tent making, and he discovers this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. We're going to come across them again next Sunday. Uh, sometimes it's Priscilla and Aquila, and uh, here on this instance, it's Aquila and Priscilla. They've come from Italy. And as Jews, they've been banished from the city of Rome by Claudius, but probably already Christian Jews. Perhaps the gospel's already come to Rome, to Rome, and already there are some who've professed faith in Jesus. And Aquila and Priscilla are now back in Corinth, and they're tent makers. And Paul joins them. He probably lives in their home and earns a living there by staying with them and working as, in order that he might survive. Eventually, Timothy and Silas arrive from Macedonia, and they come with the news to the apostle about the church there in Thessalonica and also in Philippi. You can read 1 Thessalonians, which is a marvelously encouraging letter, because that letter is being written right now here in Corinth. It's the first of Paul's many letters to be written, followed uh, probably just a few months later by 2 Thessalonians. But Paul gives an extensive summary of his time in Thessalonica. And he gives thanks to God because of their work, produced by faith and their labor, prompted by love, and their endurance inspired by hope. And he's, he's encouraged by the news that Timothy brings him concerning the work of Holy Spirit in Thessalonica. So the church is alive and growing. It is engaging in the fruits of the Spirit. This is a matter of enormous encouragement to the Apostle Paul. You remember that in 1 Thessalonians, it's a letter with the, that beautiful passage where Paul says, 
I don't want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep. And he addresses the issue of, well, what happens when you die? That Christians don't grieve like the rest who have no hope, but that through the gospel and forgiveness of sins and the hope of glory, it means that we have this assurance that when we die, our souls go immediately into the presence of Christ. And you also remember how Paul begins to speak about the second coming in 1 in first Thessalonians. That Jesus will come again upon the clouds of heaven with the trumpet of God and the archangel. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And those who are alive will be caught up in the air to meet with the Lord. And they'll always be with the Lord. So in verse 5, it looks as though, here in, in back in Acts chapter 18, it looks as though Paul is no longer making tents but that he began devoting himself perhaps to gospel ministry, perhaps because the church at Thessalonica, or was it the church at Philippi uh, through Silas, that they had brought a gift to Paul, freeing him to now devote his entire time to gospel ministry. But there's this hostility, blasphemy even, in the synagogue at Corinth. And it's at this point that Paul shakes out his clothes and he utters these words from now on, I go to the Gentiles. Your blood be on your own heads, I'm innocent. Basically, I've spoken the truth to you. I've delivered the message, my conscience is clear. And brothers and sisters, that's what we're called to do. Of course, we are to speak the gospel with love and and humility. We're to speak it as one needy beggar, telling other beggars where they may find the bread of life. But, But we can't save anyone. We're simply messengers. So we simply deliver the message And we counsel people in the gospel and in the scriptures, and then we pray. It's totally up to God. And then you have to smile when you read verse 7. How far does Paul move away from the synagogue when he shakes off his clothes at these Jews who are rejecting the gospel and are rejecting Christ and, and saying no to the offer of mercy and forgiveness of sins? How far does Paul go? Well, he goes right next door to this man, Titius Justus. And we don't know... Uh, whether Paul stayed there or if he, if he stayed with Aquila and Priscilla. But he's there every day, and these Jews who were so hostile would see him. Perhaps they would even hear him. I wonder if he stood in the doorway there proclaiming the gospel so that they could still hear him in the room next door in the synagogue. And then, lo and behold, in verse 8, this man Crispus, the synagogue ruler, the one who would be in charge of the synagogue services, the most respected Jew in Corinth, No doubt, well, he is converted. So to Paul, who may have been feeling dejected at this point, but certainly to a man by his own, who by his own admission comes to Corinth in fear and trembling and much weakness, he's in need of the Lord's help and, and encouragement and benediction. What better help and encouragement could there be than see than the sight of a sinner coming to Christ and confessing Jesus? And what better therapy for the Apostle Paul and his dejected spirit? that the ruler of the synagogue professes faith in Christ. But there are others, because we read in verse 8 that many of the Corinthians, when they heard they were believing, they were being baptized. So again, we see this extraordinary movement of Holy Spirit as God comes down and there's this definitive, powerful work now beginning to emerge in the city of Corinth. But there's a division, a division between Jews and Gentiles. It's a turning point. Paul's now heading in the direction of Gentile ministry. And I think it's deeply significant that it's from Corinth later when Paul returns to Corinth on his third missionary journey that he probably writes his letter to the church at Rome. And you remember that it's in that letter of, in the city of Corinth, you remember that he reflects there as he's writing to the, to the Romans in Romans 9, 10, and 11. He reflects on the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles and the relationship between the church and the church and Israel, and he asked those great and profound questions as to what that division means, and as to what the rejection of the Jews of the gospel means, that Jewish rejection means Gentile acceptance. And he talks, you remember, about the jealousy on the part of Jews because of the Gentiles growing in numbers and in faith until all Israel shall be saved. Well, that's definitely another sermon, so don't worry, we're not going to go there this morning. But one thing is certain Paul is reflecting on the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles, and he's saying that none of this, what's happened in Corinth, none of this has thwarted the redemptive purposes of a sovereign God in saving his people. 
Because all of, the true, all of true Israel will be saved. Whatever happened in Corinth, whatever this rejection by the Jews of the gospel means, you know there's nothing like conversions to cheer the soul. It's a wonderful thing to see a fresh convert and to see the joy that burst out of their heart as they've, they've realized who Jesus is, they've fallen in love with him for the first time. Oh, that we would see those kind of conversions. Oh, that we would see them our neighbors converted and our family members converted. We'll, we'll see those with whom we work converted to faith in Jesus Christ. So first we see a statement from the Apostle Paul that he's made this decision to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. And then secondly, second main point on your outline this morning, God's encouragement to Paul. In verses 9 and 10, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no man will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And there are at least four things that the Lord now seems to be saying to the Apostle Paul. He begins with, do not be afraid. It's hard to imagine the Apostle Paul being afraid in some ways. When we see him in Scripture, uh, you know, afraid of men, afraid of the Jews, afraid of pain perhaps. But, you know, if you'd, if you'd had 39 lashes applied to your back just once, I guarantee you, you don't want it for a second time. I've never had it happen to me once, and I don't want it the first time. But whatever the potential fear Paul may have had, God in his omniscience is speaking a word, knowing that the, what the Apostle Paul is experiencing and what he's going to experience in his soul. And he's saying to him, do not be afraid. Do, do you know how many times that little phrase occurs in Scripture? If you have Bible software on your computer or a concordance, I mean, you could probably even Google it, but look up in the Bible how many times God uses the words, do not be afraid. Just quickly, a few examples. Remember when Joshua is given the charge to become the successor to Moses? You remember what God says to him? Do not be afraid. When Elisha is surrounded by the armies of the Syrians on, on the mountains all around him, God says to him, do not be afraid. When the disciples are in the boat on the storm in the Sea of Galilee, Jesus says to them, Do not be afraid. When the women come to the tomb and Jesus has already risen from the dead and they come there, Jesus says to them, Do not be afraid. Every time God says those words in Scripture, it is in the context of His covenant with His people, the covenant of grace. It's an encouragement to us that God loves His people with an everlasting love. We can trust Him. We have no reason to fear anything, especially humans. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4, and also 9 through 11, says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? And then in verses 9 through 11, Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call, this I know that God is for me, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? And so the first encouragement is do not be afraid. And then secondly, he says, go on speaking and do not be silent. I wonder why Paul was even tempted not to speak. Perhaps this is only conjecture on my part, but perhaps it's about that time that the Apostle Paul would be now beginning to formulate in his mind as the Holy Spirit is, is moving upon him and preparing him uh, as the Apostle to write all these other epistles. Perhaps it's about this time in his life when he's beginning to think through the implications of the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, doctrine of predestination and election, as, as he will write in all of the fullness and glory to his letters to the Ephesians and also to the Romans, especially in the letter to the Philippians, in the opening chapter about verse 6, where he's talking about the sovereignty of God. I wonder if that was beginning to form in his mind, and God is saying to him categorically, whatever the doctrine of predestination is, don't stop speaking it. Don't stop evangelizing. Don't stop doing what I ask you to do. Well, then thirdly, you see those those beautiful words there, I am with you. Again, those words are based on God's covenantal promises. Uh, we are the Lord's and the Lord is ours. And all of that, that biblical covenant theology and context should come to mind when we read in Scripture where God says, I am with you. There's that, that passage, isn't there, in, in the, the ministry and the life and circumstances of Joseph in the Old Testament. Where you remember Joseph's if sold into slavery... 
He's later accused of rape. He's in prison. He's abandoned in prison for 10 years. And you remember in the book of Genesis, it says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. When the Lord is with you, when the Lord is by you, when he's near you, when he's underneath you, when he's all around you, when the Lord is sustaining you and carrying you, what else is there to fear? What harm? Can befall you? What terror can come by night that could truly make you afraid? Paul, do not be afraid because I'm with you. The sovereign Lord is with you. The God who delivered the people through the Red Sea is with you. The God of Moses is with you. The God of Elijah is with you. The God of Elisha is with you. The God of the prophets is with you. He says, and I have many people in this city. What an incentive that must have been as Paul stays on another 18 months in the city, that God has his people in the city, maybe people who have yet to be converted, but they are the Lord's and they will be converted in the near future. They're his elect. And and through Paul's ministry and the the preaching of the gospel and the work of evangelism, God's going to draw these people to himself. So that's mainly point two, God's encouragement to Paul. And then thirdly, Third main point on your outline this morning, God's promise of comfort to all his people in times of trial. <clears throat> There's trouble in verses 14 and 15. And this time is from Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, the chief civil magistrate of the district based in Corinth. And it's brought by the Jews against Paul. And he's brought to what in the Greek is, is called the, the Bema. It's a, it's a raised flat platform known as the judgment seat. And Paul is put there to stand before Gallio to answer the charges that the Jews are making against him, which were, this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And whatever the sense of that, Gallio interpreted that what Paul was saying was something that belonged essentially to Judaism. And as far as Gallio seemed to be concerned, what Paul is saying about words and names about which he had, had no interest So this was an internal matter to be settled by the Jews. And then in verse 17, it says, They all began to to attack Sosthenes. Who are they all? Who who, who is that? Are they Gentiles who are now attacking Sosthenes as a leader of the synagogue like Crispus was? Or or was it the Jews themselves attacking their own leader because uh, he had made them look so stupid in the eyes of Gallio? In 1 Corinthians 1, the opening verse begins, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. Is that the same Sosthenes? He's writing to the Corinthians, and right up front there, he has a greeting, not just from himself, but from Sosthenes, who at this point, in Acts 18, is still the leader of the synagogue, but now has perhaps been turned against by the Jews. i got no way of proving that, but I want to suggest to you this morning, wouldn't it be an extraordinary thing Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing, the kind of thing that God would do, that not only did he convert Crispus, this synagogue leader, but when they elected Sosthenes as their replacement, God converted him as well. And thereby, an extraordinary work of God's grace is evident here in the city of Corinth. This would have been most encouraging to the Apostle Paul. Of course, it was primarily to bring glory to God, but also the encouragement that must have been to Paul. It would have reaffirmed to him that he didn't have any need to be afraid because the sovereign God of heaven and earth, the God of mercy and grace, was with him. And dear friends, you know, there are details here that belong entirely to this story, but there's a general principle here that applies to each of us because God speaks to all of his children and he says, you have no need to be afraid. He does not promise that no harm will come upon us as he promised Paul here. And by the way, he promised Paul this one time in Corinth. God did not promise it. And it's not true of Paul in Lystra and in Derb or Philippi or Thessalonica or Berea. It was only true here in Corinth. So we, we can't take that text and just run with it and say, okay, no harm will come to us. But you know, wherever you are, whatever circumstances you face, God says to us, I will never leave you or forsake you, I will be with you. You know, several of my um, historical heroes in the faith, I guess, they experienced serious bouts of discouragement, fear, depression. 
I mean, it's likely that, that Martin Luther did. Charles Spurgeon, certainly, it's, it's pretty well documented that he had a lifelong struggle with depression. If you've ever read anything about Spurgeon, you know a little bit about him. Uh, at age 22, he was a pastor of a large church. And with twin babies at home to look after, he was preaching to thousands of people in, the, in a music hall when pranksters yelled fire. And so they started a panic to exit the building. And in that panic, seven people were killed and 28 were severely injured. His mind was never the same after that. His, his wife, Susanna, wrote, My beloved's anguish was so deep and violent that reason seemed to totter in her throne, and we sometimes feared that he would never preach again. Then from the age of 33, physical pain became a large and a constant feature of Spurgeon's life. He suffered from a kidney inflammation called Bright's disease, as well as gout, rheumatism, and neuritis. The pain was such that, that it kept him from preaching for one-third of the time. Added to that, overwork, stress, and the guilt about all these things began to take their toll, and all this happened in the public eye. And of course his critics just, just shredded him, which made it even more difficult to bear. Some of them even said cruelly that, well, his suffering was a judgment from God. Don't you just love Pharisees like that who say awful things? And the clinical depression hit Spurgeon so hard that he once said, I could say with Job, my soul chooseth strangling rather than life. I could readily enough have laid violent hands upon myself to escape from my misery of spirit. But in all this, Spurgeon believed that God had a good purpose in all his suffering and because of it, felt that he had become better prepared and a more compassionate pastor. But boy, did he battle depression. And here's what he had to say on the reality of sorrow. Spurgeon said, I am the subject of depressions of spirit so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such extremes of wretchedness as I go to. He also said, I wonder every day that there are not more suicides considering the troubles in this life. He said, the road to sorrow has been well trodden. It is the regular sheep track to heaven, and all the flock of God have to pass along it. But then, on the, on the other side, he said, he looks to God's promises of comfort and strength. He says, an ointment for every wound and a cordial for every faintness, a remedy for every disease. Blessed is he who is skilled in heavenly pharmacy, and knows how to lay hold of the healing virtues of, prom of the promises of God. He says to be cast down is often the best thing that could happen to us. It is an unspeakable consolation that our Lord Jesus knows this experience. Boy, I, I just absolutely love that honesty. But then he clings to God's promises. What an encouragement to us. Because there are going to be times in your life and in my life, even as a Christian, when the darkness, when the trials and the struggle is going to seem more real to you in that moment than God does. But from Charles Spurgeon and from the Apostle Paul, we can learn the necessity of leaning hard on God's grace. That even in the valley, even when the waters come over your head, the Lord is with us and He'll never leave us or forsake us. In your sorrow and discouragement and times of depression, meditate on God's promises. Draw near to Jesus, the man of sorrows, and trust in God's providence. And what that means practically is, in your sorrows, don't isolate yourself. Don't skip worship gatherings. When facing trials, you, you can't remove yourself from community. Instead, press on into God's Word. Listen to Scripture. Be around God's people and allow the Lord to rejuvenate you, even as He has rejuvenated His servant, the Apostle Paul. Father, we thank you for the extraordinary richness of your word. Thank you for the Apostle Paul, for this great gift that you gave to the church. Thank you for other saints uh, in, that knew you and that really just were honest and transparent with all of us and yet pointed us back to Scripture. Men like, like Charles Spurgeon, 
Thank you for these wonderful evidences of conversions here in Corinth. Lord, we pray for such conversions here in Merritt Island and Rockledge and Vieira and Coco and Coco Beach and, and in Faith Presbyterian Church. We want to see those who've never been baptized before as believers come here and be baptized and, and claim the name of Christ and confess Him to be Savior and Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords. Father, you can do it because there's nothing too hard for you. So Lord, will you encourage us and draw us near to yourself and set our hearts ablaze for Christ's sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.